Chapter 16 from Strange Pages from Family Papers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Strange Pages from Family Papers by T. F. Thistleton Dyer. Chapter 16 Lucky Accidents. As the unthought-on accident is guilty of what we wildly do, so we profess ourselves to be the slaves of chance, and flies of every wind that blows. Winter's Tale, Act Four, Scene Three. Pascal one day remarked that if Cleopatra's nose had been shorter, the whole face of the world would probably have been changed. The same idea may be applied to the unforeseen advantages produced by accidents, some of which have occasionally had not a little to do with determining the future position in life of many eminent men. Prevented from pursuing the sphere in this world they had intended, compulsory leisure compelled them to adopt some hobby as a recreation, in which, unconsciously, their real genius lay. Thus David Allen, popularly known as the Scottish Hogarth, owed his fame and success in life to an accident. When a boy, having burnt his foot, he amused the monotony of his leisure hours by drawing on the floor with a piece of chalk, a mode of passing his time which soon obtained an extraordinary fascination for him. On returning to school, he drew a caricature of his schoolmaster punishing a pupil, which caused him to be summarily expelled. But despite this punishment, his success as an artist was decided the caricature being considered so clever that he was sent to Glasgow to study art, where he was apprenticed in 1755 to Robert Foulis, a famous painter, who with his brother Andrew had secretly established an academy of arts in that city. Their kindness to him he was afterwards able to return, when their fortunes were reversed. If Sir Walter Scott had not sprained his foot in running round the room when a child, the world would probably have had none of those works which have made his name immortal. When his son intimated a desire to enter the army, Sir Walter Scott wrote to Southerly, I have no title to combat a choice which would have been my own, had not my lameness prevented. In the same way the effects of a fall when about a year old rendered Talleyrand lame for life, and being on this account unfit for a military career, he was obliged to renounce his birthright in favour of his second brother. But what seemed an obstacle to his future success was the very reverse. For turning his attention to politics and books, he eventually became one of the leading diplomatists of his day. Again, Josiah Wedgwood was seized in his boyhood with an attack of smallpox, which was followed by a disease in the right knee, some years afterwards necessitating the amputation of the affected limb. But... As Mr. Gladstone, in his address on Wedgwood's life and work delivered at Burslem, October 26, 1863, remarked, the disease from which he suffered was, no doubt, the cause of his subsequent greatness for... It prevented him from growing up to be the active, vigorous English workman, but it put upon him considering whether, as he could not be that, he might not be something else and something greater. It drove him to meditate upon the laws and secrets of his art. Flamsteed was an astronomer by accident. Being removed from school on account of his health, it appears that a cold caught in the summer of 1660 while bathing, which produced a rheumatic affection of the joints, accompanied by other ailments. He became unable to walk to school and finally left in May 1662. His self-training now began, and Sacraborco's De Sphera was lent to him, with the perusal of which he was so pleased that he forthwith commenced a course of astronomic studies. Accordingly he constructed a rude quadrant and calculated a table of the sun's altitudes, pursuing his studies, as he said himself, under the discouragement of friends, the want of health, and all other instructors except his better genius. Alluding to accidents as sometimes developing greatness, Mr. Smiles remarks that Pope's satire was in a measure the outcome of his deformity, and Lord Byron's club foot, he adds, had probably not a little to do with determining his destiny as a poet. Had not his mind been embittered and made morbid by his deformity, 
he might never have written a line. But his misshapen foot stimulated his mind, roused his ardour, threw him upon his own resources, and we know with what result. Again, in numerous other ways it has been remarked, accidents have taken a lucky turn, and if not being the road to fortune, have had equally important results. The story is of a young officer in the army of General Wolfe, who was supposed to be dying of an abscess in the lungs. He was absent from his regiment on sick leave, but resolved to join it when a battle was expected, for, said he, since I am given over, I had better be doing my duty, and my life's being shortened a few days matters not. He received a shot which pierced the abscess and made an opening for the discharge, the result being that he recovered and lived to eighty years of age. Brunel, the celebrated engineer, had a curious accident which might have forfeited his life. While one day playing with his children, and astonishing them by passing a half-sovereign through his mouth out at his ear, he unfortunately swallowed the coin, which dropped into his windpipe. Brunel regarded the mischief caused by the accident as purely mechanical. A foreign body had got into his breathing apparatus and must be removed, if at all, by some mechanical expedient. But he was equal to the emergency, and had an apparatus constructed which had the effect of relieving him of the coin. In after days he used to tell how, when his body was inverted, and he heard the gold piece strike against his upper front teeth, was, perhaps, the most exquisite moment in his whole life, the half-sovereign having been in his windpipe for not less than six weeks. In the year 1784 William Pitt almost fell the victim to the folly of a festive meeting, for he was nearly accidentally shot as a highwayman. Returning late at night on horseback from Wimbledon to Addiscombe, together with Lord Thurlow, he found the turnpike gate between Tooting and Streatham thrown open. Both passed through it, regardless of the threats of the turnpike man, who, taking the two for highwaymen, discharged the contents of his blunderbuss at their backs. But happily no injury was done, and Pitt had the good fortune to escape from what might have been a very serious, if not fatal, accident. Foote, too, met with a bad accident on horseback, which at the time seemed a lasting obstacle to his career as an actor. Whilst riding with the Duke of York and some other noblemen, he was thrown from his horse and his leg broken, so that an amputation became necessary. In consequence of this accident, the Duke of York obtained for him the patent of the Haymarket Theatre for his life, but he continued to perform his former characters with no less agility and spirit than he had done before to the most crowded houses. Similarly, on one occasion, a very important one, Charles James Matthews was nearly prevented making his first appearance on the stage through being thrown from his horse, but, to quote his own words, the excitement of the evening dominated all other feelings, and I walked for the time as well as ever. Some men, again, have owed their success to the accidents of others. A notable instance was that of Baron Ward, the well-known minister of the Duke of Parma. After working sometimes as a stable-boy in Howden, he went to London, where he had the good luck to come to the Duke of Parma's assistance after a fall from his horse in Rotten Row. The Duke took him back to Lucca as his groom, and ere long Ward made the ducal stud the envy of Italy. He soon rose to a higher position, and became the minister and confidential friend of the Duke of Parma, with whom he escaped in the year 1848 to Dresden, and for whom he succeeded in recovering Parma and Placenza. Indeed, Lord Palmerston once remarked, Baron Ward was one of the most remarkable men I ever met with. It was through witnessing an accident that Sir Astley Cooper made up his final decision to take up surgery as his profession. A young man, having been run over by a cart, was in danger of dying from loss of blood. When young Cooper lost no time in tying his handkerchief about the wounded limb, so as to stop the hemorrhage. It was this incident which assured him of his taste for surgery. In the same way, the story is quoted of the eminent French surgeon, Ambrose Paré. It is stated that he was acting as stable-boy to an abbey at Laval, 
when a surgical operation was about to be performed on one of the brethren of the monastery. On being called in to assist, Ambrose Parry not only proved so useful, but was so fascinated with the operation that he made up his mind to devote his life to the study and practice of surgery. Instances of this kind might be enumerated, being a frequent occurrence in biographical literature, and showing to what unforeseen circumstances men have occasionally owed their greatness. A romance which, had it lacked corroborative evidence, would have seemed highly improbable, is told of the two countesses of Kelly. In the latter half of the last century, Mr. Gordon, the proprietor of Ardoch Castle, situated upon a high rock overlooking the sea, was one evening aroused by the firing of a gun evidently from a vessel in distress near the shore. Hastening down to the beach, with the servants of the castle, it was evident that the distressed vessel had gone down, as the floating spars but too clearly indicated. After looking out in vain for some time in the hope of recovering some of the passengers, either dead or alive, he found a sort of crib, which had been washed ashore containing a live infant. The little creature proved to be a female child, but beyond the fact that its wrappings pointed to its being the offspring of persons in no mean condition, there was no trace as to who these were. The little foundling was brought up with Mr. Gordon's own daughters, and when she had attained to womanhood by an inexplicable coincidence, a storm similar to that just mentioned occurred. An alarm gun was fired, and this time Mr. Gordon had the satisfaction of receiving a shipwrecked party, whom he at once made his guests at the castle. Amongst them was one gentleman passenger who, after a comfortable night spent in the castle, was surprised at breakfast by the entrance of a troop of blooming girls, the daughters of his host, as he understood, but one whom especially attracted his attention. "'Is this young lady your daughter, too?' he inquired of Mr. Gordon. "'No,' replied his host. "'But she is as dear to me as if she were.' He then related her history, to which the stranger listened with eager interest, and at its close he not a little surprised Mr. Gordon by remarking that he had reason to believe that the young lady was his own niece. He then gave a detailed account of his sister's return from India, corresponding to the time of the shipwreck, and added, She is now an orphan, but if I am not mistaken in my supposition, she is entitled to a handsome provision which her father bequeathed to her, in the hope of her yet being found. Before many days had elapsed, sufficient evidence was forthcoming to prove that by this strange but lucky accident of the shipwreck, the long-lost niece was found. The young heiress keenly felt leaving the old castle, but to soften the wrench it was arranged that one of the Misses Gordon should accompany her to Gottenburg, where her uncle had long been settled as a merchant. The sequel of this romance, as it is pointed out in The Book of Days, is equally astonishing. It seems that among the Scotch merchants settled in the Swedish port was Mr. Thomas Erskine, a younger son of a younger brother of Sir William Erskine of Cambo, in Fife, an offshoot of the family of the Earl of Kelly, to whom Miss Anne Gordon was married in the year 1771. A younger brother named Methven, ten years later married Joanna, a sister of Miss Gordon, it was never contemplated that these two brothers would ever come near to the peerage of their family, there being at one time seventeen persons between them and the family titles. But in the year 1797 the baronet of Cambo became Earl of Kelly, and two years later the title came to the husband of Anne Gordon. In short, these two daughters of Mr. Gordon, of Ardoch, became in succession countesses of Kelly in consequence of the accident of the shipwrecked foundling, whom their father's humanity had rescued from the waves. End of chapter 16